Okay, everybody. Thank you for braving the beautiful weather and uh, resisting uh, our healthy, walkable downtown Washington, D.C. Um, on such a wonderful day. Um, um, and welcome to the New America Foundation. Um, to everybody here in the room and also uh, we're broadcasting this live over the Internet. Um, my name is Patrick Doherty. I run the Smart Strategy Initiative here. Um, and we're just really excited to have uh, a good friend and, and brilliant leader, Dr. Richard Jackson, um, here with us today and just an incredible team of, uh, of respondents to help us lead us into this important conversation. Um, uh, let me open with a few thoughts. Um, I fundamentally believe that we're on the verge of an incredibly prosperous, secure, and sustainable economic transformation in this country. Um, I also believe that the array of challenges and threats facing our nation at home and abroad um, are urgent and connected. And if we don't make this transition, um, we're in some real trouble. Um, our project here is actually embedded in the National Security Studies Program um, for a good reason. These challenges, at both at home and abroad, are real threats to our national security. Um, if we can't, if we're poisoning our, our food system, if we're making our people unhealthy by how we design our communities, um, if we're destroying the environment, um, we've got a real security challenge. Um, if our economy is, is not performing, if we're stuck in a 10-year deleveraging, um, we're going to have a hard time meeting our obligations overseas. Um, and what we're focusing on is the question of grand strategy. Um, it's a discipline that Eisenhower and Roosevelt practiced uh, so many years ago to lead us through two great global challenges. Um, and we believe that it's, once again, that discipline of grand strategy that can take us into the, um, a, a prosperous new uh, 21st century. Uh, but we fundamentally have to understand how that system was designed. Um, um, and with this, these great speakers today, we're going to get into a fundamental element of that design, uh, the design of our communities. Um, um, Back when Roosevelt and Eisenhower were doing grand strategy, especially around Eisenhower and Truman, um, they understood that grand strategy was the correlation of your economic engine and your national security strategy. And, a nas and an, an economic engine had to be rooted in, um, in domestic, had to be rooted in some type of demand. And the demand after World War II was fundamentally about two things. It was pent up consumer demand and pent up demand for housing. Um, our leaders here in Washington aimed our economic engine as we're demobilizing uh, the, the War Production Board and the wartime economy, we aimed it squarely at satisfying the demand for consumer goods and suburban housing. Um, fundamentally, we hardwired suburbia into our national strategy. Um, and now we've been running that ec economic engine 20 years after uh, its purpose. Uh, came to end um, 20 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Soviet Union. We never reevaluated that economic engine, and we're really paying the price um, uh, as the fundamental conditions and interests of the American people and the health of the American people has changed. Um, what did we do? We, we, d we did three things to, to get us into this place. We subsidized suburbia. We industrialized agriculture. Um, and we... We fundamentally taxed labor while subsidizing resource consumption. That fundamental formula is at the heart of our problem. Um, and understanding that, we can start to design something better. Um, so the good news is those designs are already being drawn up. And the, the folks on today's panel, um, Dr. Jackson especially, um, have been leading the conversation in how we um, correct those mistakes. Um, it's an exciting time. I'm, I'm positive because um, right now the demand in the marketplace for healthy communities is, as Chris will attest, 56% um, of, of Americans want the attributes of smart growth walkable, service-rich, transit-oriented communities in their next housing purchase. That's three times the level of the demand that existed after World War II. Um, if we can't do it with that level of demand, we can't do it at all. Um, there's an incredible attractor here that we just need to um, focus the nation on. Um, so 
without further ado, let me introduce um, our speakers today in this, this, this great uh, talk. Um, first, my friend Dick Jackson. Um, thank you for coming. Um, it's great to have you back. Um, he's the, Dick is the, is the chair of the Environmental Health Program at UCLA, um, where he came after um, 15 years at uh, CDC, where he ran the National Center on Environmental Health. Um, he's a pediatrician and an epidemiologist. Um, and when at CDC, he did the incredible deep dive on testing the health impacts of smart growth, um, specifically looking at uh, lead ND, um, lead for neighborhood development, and coming to the to the strong conclusion that if we make this, if we make these changes in our community design, we're going to have a dramatic impact on obesity, heart disease, social isolation, as well as the spectrum of problems that come from our car culture, from asthma to impacts. Um, so we're especially excited to have him here because right now on PBS stations across the country and also here in, in, the, in the greater Washington area um, is, is his PBS special, Designing Healthy Communities. Um, so we're going to lead off with a clip from that, and then Dick is going to walk us into the material. Um, but first, let me introduce um, uh, the rest of our panel. Chris Leinberger, my good friend and, and, and co-author, um, is here. Chris is um, not only a triple thread, a quadruple or quintuple thread. He's uh, a scholar at the Brookings Institute. Um, he's a professor at the University of Michigan. Um, he's uh, uh, a writer for the Atlantic Monthly. Um, and he's been um, uh, working to change our policies uh, with a group of uh, real estate developers called Locus that he runs. Um, Chris is also a developer himself, running, running one of the most exciting um, and innovative uh, real estate development firms focusing on sustainable development that, that we've got in the country. Um, Shannon Brownlee's here. Shannon's the, our... Uh, uh, director of the health study, health policy program here at New America, um, and she's the author uh, of Overtreated: uh, Why Too Much Medicine um, Is. I always got to finish that off. Making us sicker and poorer. Um, um, she just had a great run coming off a New York New York Times Magazine cover story, um, and among other things, she's looking at this question of how do you deliver um, primary, innovative primary care services um, into uh, these new communities that we are hoping to design. And then finally, we have a newcomer to our stage, um, Amy Levner um, from AARP. Um, Amy works with the Complete street Streets Program um, at AARP, uh, focusing on making communities friendly for aging citizens um, with a full spectrum of services, accessibility, and livability. Um, and with boomers uh, just about, just already last year hitting 65, um, AARP is going to be on the vanguard of this push. And with their kind of political clout, we're really excited about the potential here. So with that, um, what I want to do is queue up uh, Dick's six-minute video. And we'll have Dick come up and make his presentation, and then we'll bring the panel up and we'll have some conversation. Okay? Um, and with that, uh, John, if you can get it going. There we go. Thanks so much. I worked for 30 years doing epidemic investigations and looking at chemical effects on people, um, air pollution, a whole series of issues. And about 10 years ago, while I was at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, I became really engrossed, almost obsessed with the fact that we have built America in a way that is, I believe, fundamentally unhealthy. How many of you are taking medicine for asthma? To see your son not be able to take a breath is one of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with. Every parent out there whose child has asthma understands how I feel. We could not have designed an environment that is more difficult for people's well-being at this point, particularly as we look at epidemics of obesity. Diabetes. Diabetes is not a good thing to fool around with. I went in for some treatment. They said I was going to take my foot off. With young people that I work with, the 
population that were obese are now heading towards morbid obesity. We're looking at the first generation in American history to have a shorter lifespan than their parents. In 2001, members of Congress thought that I should be fired because I dared suggest that how we were building America might be bad for our health, might be making us overweight, unfit, depressed, and lonely. In 2001, my views were considered so controversial they almost got me fired. Today, they are at the center of a provocative new television series. Now being broadcast on public television stations throughout the United States, Designing Healthy Communities is a four-hour mini-series and companion book based on my extensive work in the field of public health. You and the folks that are providing people good and healthy food, you're more a doctor than I am. As a practicing physician, author, former director of the National Center for Environmental Health at CDC, and current professor and chair of environmental health sciences at UCLA. I'm a professor at UCLA, but my passion is how we build where we live and how it affects people's health and why we need to rebuild all the places that we live in ways that make us all better, young, old, and everybody in between. Too big a topic to be contained in just one program, we traveled around our nation filming in communities large and small with a vast variety of design and health-related issues. Each of the one-hour episodes tackles specific problems and offers realistic solutions that will promote better health and enhance the overall quality of our lives. On the first of four episodes, the time has come for the retrofitting of suburbia. We will see communities that are combating the causes of type 2 diabetes, not through medication and amputation, but by redesigning our car-centric society. The second episode gives insights on rebuilding places of the heart. We visit cities struggling to resuscitate their dying downtowns, where the polluting sins of past industries haunt the future. This lake is a super fun lake, the only super fun lake in the United States. You look at the problems and you recognize them and, and you grieve over them, but at the same time you look and see what can be done and you do your best to help. All across our nation, young people are working to better their cities and neighborhoods by redesigning places of the heart. Social Policy in Concrete is our third program. Differences in life expectancy between uh, the, the, the poorest neighborhoods and the wealthiest neighborhoods exceed 10 years. And we tell people in our county, give me your address, I'll tell you how long you live. We see how low-income neighborhoods are affected by pollution and how the city of Detroit struggles to save itself. And today, we are ground zero. We are the New Orleans without Katrina. On the last episode, I go searching for Shangri-La. Can the perfect community exist? It would be a place where kids would feel safe and senior citizens could walk and feel like um, they were protected and well thought of. We seek to find perfect communities, large and small, past and present, that embody the intricate balance of health-promoting design and the human needs for fulfillment and happiness. When you come home, you want to feel a sense of haven, and that's what people feel here. In addition to the series, educator Stacy Sinclair and I have written a companion book that offers in further detail the root causes of our national health crisis and highlights community design solutions to these problems. I was recently honored to be the sole guest on the PBS nationally broadcast Tavis Smiley Show. And for too long we've been worrying about things far away or very minute. And it was time to think about designing and building places that work for people. Mm -hmm. But I hope that message gets through and I'm honored to have you on this program. Thank you for the work that you are doing and uh, all the best to you. Thank you, Tavis. Here's what people are saying. In her health column in the New York Times, Jane Brody wrote, the four-part series that Dr. Jackson developed highlights changes being made in forward-thinking communities, changes that foster better physical and mental health by redesigning the built environment. Paul Goldberger, architecture critic for The New Yorker, declared, you wouldn't expect a doctor to write one of the most important books about planning towns and cities. But that is exactly what Richard Jackson has done. And from Bart Sokolow of Environmental Advisors, you have a winner, poignant and to the point. I hope it becomes a vehicle for change. People can view these programs and say, 
we can do that. And that's what we hope too. We intend designing healthy communities to be a positive catalyst, the beginning of a movement that will lead to significant change all over our nation. Watch my new mini-series, Designing Healthy Communities, as we seek to improve our national health. This came out of, uh, frankly, 10 years of lectures and going around and realizing that talking to um, 100 people at a time um, was not going to get the message out. At this point, this is shown in about 10 million households, at least one hour of it, around the United States. Uh, we'd like to see it um, be captured at, at a much larger level. Um, I also want to thank the American Institute of Architects that gave us the first uh, grant to get it going, and Kresge and uh, Kellogg and a number of other foundations, California Endowment very much so, have been a, a big help as it's gone forward. Um, the, this is the companion book. This is the textbook I use in my course at UCLA. It has very deep discussions, everything from social capital to built environment to engineering, air, qu water quality, etc. This is the more personal and emotional book that goes along with the TV series. You can imagine I had a real dilemma with my producers because on one hand I'm going, all the stuff you're doing is completely kumbaya, it's all about feelings, and they're going, all the stuff you're doing is about numbers and graphs and charts, and getting the balance between the two where you've got the right brain, the left brain, the intellect and the emotion going at the same time it was not easy but very gratifying. I'm a pediatrician, and if you take your child to the pediatrician, first thing they're going to do is do the height and weight. And you want your child to have their weight at roughly the same percentile as their height. So if a child comes in and he's 50th percentile for height, oh, that's great. But if he's 95th percentile for weight, they're really worried, and they're worried about how this is tracking. They check the blood pressure, it's too high, the cholesterol's too high, the child's showing signs of depression. And I say to my pediatric friends, do you see anyone like this? I say, oh yeah, we see four or five a day just like this. And my primary care internist friends, and my son is a primary care internist, says he is also, they are seeing four or five of these people a day. This is the new America. Now, a good doctor would obviously not immediately put the child on all kinds of drugs. The child would be put on, uh, let's go to the overweight clinic, uh, let's think about how we can intervene. No soft drinks in the house. And that's a message for everyone that's listening here. They don't belong in your offices, Patrick, and they don't belong <laughs> in the house. Um, uh, no TV screen in the bedroom, and that's going to be hard for a lot of families, but it parks kids far too long, and the child has to build exercise back into his life. Two months later, the child comes back, hasn't really lost any weight, can't change the food at school, can't stay after school for sports because the bus leaves then and there's no other way to get home. Uh, there's no time to exercise, and when I get home, the neighborhood doesn't have anywhere where I can walk. And two months after that, the child's taking something for his cholesterol, his blood pressure, perhaps for his depression, um, at a rough cost of about $400 a month. Someone's paying that much for the care of what I will assert is an environmentally induced disease. This is about the environment this child's operating in, not the fundamental personality. And um, actually, one of my nieces heard this talk and at the end said, I'm learning that the kids of our generation are bad. And I said, oh, no, no, that's not what I meant. I think what our generation's done to you is bad, but I don't think, I think you're great. In fact, the salvation and the heart of that show is over and over again, I came face to face with really worried, but very concerned young people that want to change the world, and they're very unhappy with the world that we have given them, whether it's environmental, economic, or, or social. The environment's rigged against the child, and it's rigged against the doctor, and it's rigged against the best of us. Very much as what Patrick said. The, and that model that we uh, embraced so effectively in 1950 and 1960 was probably fine in 1950 for a while, but it, we've outrun its, its lifespan. When I was a young doc, I thought that 7% of all the money in the United States going to medical care was a lot of money. It's now 17, 18%, and Shannon, I won't st you'll talk about this in more depth, but and as Patrick knows, you can't run an economy on 18% medical services. Sooner or later, the system doesn't work. You would think we were desperately healthy, but uh, we're 47th for lifespan. Um, for males, for example, we're better than Slovenia, but the people in uh, Costa Rica live just as long as we do, spending about seven times less than we do. 
Now, a hundred years ago, we were confronted with not epidemics of obesity and diabetes, we were confronted with epidemics of infectious diseases, one of the leading causes of death with tuberculosis, Inter uh, intestinal diseases related to bad water, diseases related to bad air. And how did we get out of that? We didn't do it by discovering particularly discovering viruses or even working on bacteria. We did it by changing our infrastructure, changing the physical environments we were in. If you want to get rid of um, most of the intestinal diseases, the biggest thing you can do is provide clean and safe water to people. It's investing in that infrastructure for water. If you want people to grow and be healthier, you invest in high quality, diverse food sources, not a unitary f form of processed foods. Um, if you want people to reduce their tuberculosis levels, and this was the white plague in the 19th century, the most important thing we did was get rid of crowding and create high quality housing with good quality air, good day lighting, reduce the uh, loading, and not have five people in a room. So prosperity is really important in terms of turning that epidemic around. We've added 30 years to the lifespan of Americans um, in the last 110, 120 years, 30 years. And I'm sure a lot of my medical colleagues would say, well, that's our medical system. That's why we're living so much longer. How many of those years have come from the medical system and medical care of the 30 years that we've added? That's how much longer we live than our great grandparents. It's about five years. Everything else has been either infrastructure changes that I've just talked about or, or mixed with economic or it's immunization. Immunization has been a powerful changer in our health status in the U.S. In this century, we've gotten, here's the top five, but uh, others, are, what do we think the big diseases of, the, of uh, the next 100 years are? They're either related to these chronic diseases that we've talked about in the video. I would assert that worldwide, climate change is going to have major health impacts, whether it's nutrition or, or droughts, uh, et cetera. And then aspects of an aging population, and we can't pretend that that's not going on in not just our society, but worldwide. Now, as, as Patrick laid out, the, the embrace was, let's put people in housing, and the first homes had perhaps no car gara no garage or a one-car garage, and they were on average about 12 to 1,500 square feet, and families were three to, you know, three, four kids was very common at that period of time. I'm the oldest of seven, by the way. Um, now our average families are down to about two children or sometimes less. Um, so the homes of, the families have gotten smaller, the homes have gotten bigger, and what's the meta, meta message of this building as you drive past and look at what it's trying to tell you is the most important aspect of the life of this owner. We are the appendage to the automobile, and in a way it's a metaphor for America. This is a liver biopsy, and um, in it you see the uniform formation of all the cells here. No, this is, of course, American suburbia, and if you ask any 15-year-old girl, and we have a whole segment where we interview kids in Smyrna, Georgia, um, who are 14, 15, and 16 about their life, and they talk about what it's like, and over and over again, the B word comes up, and it's boring. I need to have somebody take me absolutely everywhere. And where I live in LA, I live without a car. Um, I do my best to uh, go everywhere uh, on public transportation. LA probably worked fine, except for the air pollution in 1950, 1955. You see those pictures of the opening of Disneyland, and there's three cars in Anaheim on the freeway. It's amazing. And now, this is the typical thing. It doesn't work when you're trying to move 12 million people in 12 million cars each, you know, every time you want to move a 175 pound person, you move a 3,700 pound car. Now, um, our students are feeling quite depressed, I think, and, and so General Motors had a solution on October 12th in all the uh, school and university newspapers across the country, the big ones anyway, they had this ad informing our students how they should deal with the confrontation they have in their lives, and it led with reality sucks. And it said, luckily, the GM college discount doesn't stop peddling, start driving. There's a picture of a pretty girl smiling or maybe smirking at the guy on the bicycle. The guy on the bike's doing exactly what we want. He's exercising. He's not polluting. He's reducing congestion. But my students have informed me that I have read this picture wrong. She's actually flirting with him and doesn't want to be in the car with the flabby guy that's driving around. <laughs> But looking at this, uh, this is, you know, talking about depression, this is the most prevalent disorder in America. Four-fold increase, 400% increase in people in the prime of life, 18 to 44, taking antidepressants. Now, for 
50,000 years, human beings knew how to deal with depression. We all went through times of loss and times that were, were bad, and we dealt with it with ritual. We dealt with it with music. We dealt with it by being together. We dealt with it with food and celebrations. It was community that got us through the hard stuff. And in many ways, we've eroded the community. Uh, bowling alone, the fact that the more you commute, the less you can connect with the people that are around you. Driving a car, it's it's great, but it's not as safe as being on steel on steel, being a, in a rail, uh, rail. It's even less safe than being in an air, a commercial aircraft in the United States. Um, and every time you drive 100 miles in the US, you buy a one in a million lottery ticket for death. And we don't think about that, that we're really, you know, this is inherently risky. By the way, the males in this room all think that we're better than average drivers. But the truth is, ultimately, it's a, it's a lottery, and your, your number is going to come up sooner or later if you buy enough miles uh, to go there. The leading cause of years of life lost after cancer in our US population, partly because so many young people are involved in car crashes. And so I've been very active on the UC, like UCLA campus and around the University of California with 20 is plenty. At 20 miles an hour, if you're hit by a 20 mile an hour car as a pedestrian, you have about a 5% chance of dying. At 30 miles an hour, you have a 45% chance of dry, di dying. There's no reason that people on the UCLA campus or in um, heavily dense urban areas need to be driving over 20 miles an hour. In fact, if you set the lights to move at 20, they can get where they want to go more quickly than if um, there's a lot of stop and go built into it. I, by the way, completely reject the argument that w the way we should deal with the aging of the population, Amy, is to redesign all of our roads with wider turn lanes and rounded corners so old folks that can't see so well. I mean, I'd really would rather they be in a neighborhood where they can meet all their needs without having to get in the car. Our worst air pollution is in places with the most cars, the most sunlight, and the most heat. I won't drag this one out, but um, we cannot pretend that air pollution is unrelated. If you live in a highly air polluted area versus a non-air polluted area, if you're pregnant, your baby's going to weigh about six ounces less. If you're going to school and uh, go off to high school and you uh, are in a highly air polluted area in Los Angeles, for example, and you play three sports for four years, at the end of that time, you will have three times the risk of having asthma as the kids who went to the high schools that ha had very good air quality. So even though people say, oh, I have a right to my car. Yeah, you do, but you don't have a right to damage the health of the child who I am very proud of doing all the things I want them to be doing, like sports and, and athletics and academics and uh, contributions. The big driver, of course, will be obesity and diabetes. and um, these are the most important health communication tools probably of the last 20 years. Every political leader knows how to read maps. And when you see the map of the US go from 1991 for obesity rates to 1997, over 20% of the people in Indiana, to 2004 with over 25%, Chris, of the people in uh, Michigan, to 2009, brand new color, uh, over 30% of the population in a whole bunch of the states being obese. We've added about 25 pounds to every ad average adult in the United States, about 14 pounds to every 14-year-old. Um, if you look at the movies from the 60s and 70s, you're always struck by even Cary Grant is so slim looking compared to what we think of as, as someone who's you know the perfect specimen uh, nowadays. Being overweight and obese is bad for us. It raises our risk of having high blood pressure, of getting a stroke, of having liver disease, gallbladder disease, bad joints, having a baby with birth defects. <coughs> and about a third of our abdominal cancers are related to obesity. It's a big deal. If, as we become obese, the big disease risk is diabetes. And, and you watch uh, Ray, who was in danger of losing his foot there. And that's one of the powers of the video is just, you know, this isn't academic or theoretical. This is, this is very real stuff in this person's life. For a woman who becomes morbidly obese, you have 90 times the risk. So suddenly, Shannon, this person's now fallen into the medical system because they need this medical care. Um, and it's better to pay for the diabetes care and, and the, even the stomach stapling surgery than it is to pay for three days a week of dialysis, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, the diabetes rates have gone up at the same time. Here's 1994. Texas at about 5% of the population being diabetic. By 2001, um, Mississippi, Alabama, about 8, 9% of the population diabetic. And by 2007, 
large portions of the population. I walk down the street now and 10% of the people in some of these states have a disease that will cost them their eyes, their kidneys, and their feet. When I was a young pediatrician, I never saw a child with type 2 diabetes. Now we call it, I'm sorry, with adult onset diabetes. Now we call it type 2 diabetes. It's more than half the kids in the pediatric diabetes clinic with what we consider old age diseases. And they have old age diseases at the same time. Um, at the rate we're going, 21% of the population, by the way, right now we're at 2% of the GDP, Patrick, going to diabetes. And at the rate we're going, over 20% of the population will have it by 2050. But Shannon, if we give everybody really, really good medical care, a third of us will have diabetes. So thinking the medical system is going to fix this is dangerous. We have engineered physical activity out of our lives. Our children have gone from two-thirds walking and biking to school to about one in eight walking and biking to school in one generation. We've engineered fitness out of our future leaders. Only a quarter of the kids in California can pass the fitness gram. Can you run walk a 12-minute mile? Even professors from Michigan can run walk a 12-minute mile. It's, uh, it, this is not good. In fact, uh, I, Patrick is closer to the Pentagon than I am, but there are very serious generals who worry about force capability when you've got two out of every seven re volunteers unfit for service because of these issues. We pr provide huge amounts of price subsidies uh, for commodities, um, corn and soy being the big ones. We provide no subsidies for uh, fruits and vegetables. If everybody in America went out and ate what the Surgeon General told us to eat, lots of fruits and vegetables, we would be out of them in three days. We nowhere near produce enough of the food that we really need to be eating. It's one of the reasons it's so expensive. We produce so much processed food, this is the Academy of Sciences report, that the average eight-year-old sees 7,600 food ads a year. Imagine being the teacher doing the half hour a year talk on what is healthy to eat and, and contrast that with being saturated. Pepsi-Cola spent $100,000 a second telling people what to drink during the Super Bowl. One of my students talked about built environment. Uh, two of my students did a drive along Sunset Boulevard. These were the ads that they saw, alcohol, entertainment, and products of the 65 ads. She then went, they went to some of the poorest neighborhoods in, in LA, did the same distance of a ride, and found that we were telling people to eat or drink alcohol. But over and over again, there were these weight loss ads situated in between the fast food ads and the high calorie food ads. So again and again, we tell and we say, oh, well, the problem of obesity is the poor people. But then we create environments that capture them in a cycle of overweight obesity and inactivity. This is a picture taken when I was a Secret Service guard for the governor of <laughs> California. No, I was health officer for about a year and a half in California. And it was to carry the message that people should eat good food and not eat food spelled backwards. Because if you eat food spelled backwards, you are a doofus. <laughs> I know to change America, we're going to have to start with the young. Every child ought to have a school garden. They ought to know where food comes from. If you have a child eat or prepare and eat food that they've grown themselves, they always think it's delicious. It is part of the life experience. Every community needs a farmer's market. I know poor people can't buy that at the prices at 9 o'clock in the morning, but at 2 in the afternoon, the prices have come down dramatically. In fact, uh, you saw me walking through the Detroit Eastern Market with Dan Carmody, who's the head of that. And I said to him, you're more of a health leader than some of us who are dealing with the medical care at the end. The Eastern Market has become a node of health that is moving out and out and out with bike routes and gardens and, and really a, a heart for the city of Los Angeles. I think part of our parks and I think in Los Angeles, every vacant lot ought to have supplied by the city a water source that people can actually convert them into community gardens. It's physical exercise, it's social entrepreneurship, it's income, and it's good health. So we need to make fitness the healthiest option, 10,000 steps a day. You reduce your risk of getting the disease that's going to cost your eyes, your kidneys, and your feet by almost 60% in pre-diabetics. No drug works as well as walking. So when we engineer walking and physical activity out of people's lives, we are depri depriving them of life, years of life. We are depriving them of liberty and freedom, and we're certainly depriving them of happiness. If you're fit, you're less hypertensive. You have lower blood pressure. 
If you are fit or the more fit you become, the less your risk of, become, of getting breast cancer and dying of breast cancer. If you're fit, the less your risk is of just dying outright. And here's my favorite slide. If uh, you're out of shape and you're older, and Amy will talk more about this, you, you can add six or more years to your lifespan simply by becoming fit. And you don't need to pay $100 a month and go to the gym with all the people in spandex. You can actually just walk as a way of having that fitness brought into your life. Um, I'll skip mental health, but in essence, what it says is uh, physical activity, particularly in green space, is as effective as the antidepressants. Can you think of anything that would be a better way of controlling depression besides socialization? The pediatricians get this. This is our policy statement for children need to grow up in neighborhoods where they have increasing autonomy. You wouldn't think of depriving your child of food or of sleep, and yet we create environments that deprive children of increasing autonomy, and that's an important part of life development. Everybody that's buying a house ought to be looking at the walk score of the real estate agent, so we show it to you until um, they have a bad walk score, and then they happen to not mention it. Um, I gave, I'm here in town for the uh, American Institute of Architects, and I gave a talk a few years ago saying, I want all new buildings to have pleasant and attractive stairways. When you walk in, you architects should be building buildings where the first thing you can see is the elevator. And I was afraid they, they would be mad at me, and the president came up to me and said, Dr. Jackson, you're completely right. We architects love stairways and vertical features. It's a much more interesting building than simply filling out flat floor plates. He went back, reconverted his office, put a beautiful stairway between the uh, land, and he says more conversations and intellectual activity goes on on those landings than anywhere else in the place. New York City and the Department of Planning has now uh, really taken this and embraced this, and I know other cities are looking at this. This is like an 80-page document. I recommend it to anyone that's watching the, the program about active design guidelines, because it has to become culturally embedded. We have, in California, worked very hard to change the constitution for growth in the state. We call it the general plan, the master plan, the overall plan for the state. You've got to build these health elements in. Sometimes it can take 10 years to have the changes happen, but it's got to be built in. Um, a quick one, light rail. Charlotte, North Carolina put a light rail system in. They put it in because it would get people downtown and increase social cohesiveness, maybe save some money for poor families that were using it, less stress for people that happy sitting on the train re riding uh, or reading or something else. Uh, but someone looked at what happened to people's health during that time after the two years after it opened. People who took the light rail were significantly more likely to meet the Surgeon General's guidelines for physical activity, and people that took the light rail lost on average six pounds, and they didn't know they were in a weight loss program. I know we've gained more than six pounds, but everybody in this country would be better off six pounds less, or at least most of us. So uh, y y my kids have volunteered, and they go and, and stencil these on the various sewers around the country, around the neighborhood. It's a noble effort, but I want to buy them a bunch of new stencils and uh, have this put um, <laughs> around every place in the country as well. So uh, with that, um, oh, last couple slides. Our young person starts to walk to school or bike uh, four days a week. He saves the family about $700 to $1,000 a year in car costs. Um, that comes out to 40,000 calories he burns per year, 11 and a half pounds of body fat. He goes back to the doctor. He's grown four inches in two years. That's what kids do. He's now down to the 65th percentile. Not perfect, but a whole lot better. His blood pressure, cholesterol, everything else is better. He's now got a girlfriend. He's not depressed. And he lives happily ever after because he's in a neighborhood that welcomes and encourages social engagement and physical activity. So with that, let me stop and thank you very much. Just call everybody up and... Um, what we wanted to do was just have um, have three great kind of respondents respond to uh, to Dick's presentation and, and start the conversation off. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, Chris. So we'll just walk all the way across in in, uh, in physical order here. Um, so Chris, um, some thoughts uh, to start us off here. You know, Paris Glendening, the former governor of uh, Maryland, taught me this that that when it comes to smart growth or transit-oriented development or walkable urbanism or whatever you want to call it, 
that there's 14 different ways to climb to the same mountaintop. And most of us, like Ellen uh, McCarthy and I, were, are, are involved with real estate planning, uh, the economics of it. Uh, Patrick has been focusing on the uh, defense and security side of this. Um, but Dick and his colleagues have been focusing on the health aspect of it. And I, I sense the health aspect is really resonating better than all of us policy wonks who talk about the, you know, the growth benefits, the, um, uh, you know, how many oil, b barrels of oil it saves, how much money we can shift from, uh, you know, saving on transportation costs and shift it into housing or maybe even, heaven forbid, savings. But I think the health aspect is possibly the most impactful. And of course, it helps when you have somebody who you have to call doctor telling you this. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I really thank Dick for this. I, I think this is terribly important. And I'm, I'm hoping we can find ways to get this more into the medical uh, profession. The public health specialists get this. The nurses get this, but unfortunately, most doctors don't. And uh, it'd be an interesting topic of, of, a, of a discussion as to why the AMA and the other mainstream doctors in this country don't seem to understand this and what can be done to move that understanding forward. That's great. Great. Amy. Uh, thanks so much for, for having me. Um, so. AARP really cares about this uh, for lots of reasons. One is that we know that our members will, and people 50 plus, will outlive their driving years. Men on an average of seven years, women on an average of 10 years. And once they outlive those driving years and they're living in the kinds of communities that, that we just saw, those, those horrible um, liver communities, uh, they're stuck. And, and the same kinds of diseases and issues present themselves and, and make themselves worse. And so this is really about quality of life for us as well. And this is just incredibly important. We've, we've talked to a lot of uh, the boomers. Patrick mentioned the boomers. And uh, we've done research with them. They're interested in the communities that are developed in a better way for them. They want it, but they don't know how to get it. Um, I think we have a real challenge. You know, we have a lot of demand, pent-up demand, but people don't know how to get to these communities. They don't know what to do. And a lot of the, the boomers we talked to talked about, they, were, they got nostalgic, and they talked about the way their communities used to be. Oh, I, I loved the neighborhood I grew up in. You know, I used to walk to school with my friends, and I used to, uh, you know, be able to run around the neighborhood and ride bikes, and I can't do that anymore, and I drive my kid to school. And, you know, um, a lot of them were saying that they had amenities within a half mile of their home, but the way neighborhoods are built, even if there's amenities within a half mile, are they, is it a safe half mile? Can they actually you know, cross the eight lane highway to get to that grocery store, or do they have to drive that half mile because there is you know, that big, big roadway there? So uh, we're finding that they're interested, but they need solutions, and, and I think that they need interventions like changing the, the built environment. Um, from an advocacy perspective, it's really interesting. You know, AARP, as, as most of you know, is known for uh, a lot of our federal uh, battles, uh, fighting for health care and um, security and, and Medicare solvency and Social Security solvency. But the future of AARP's advocacy is really going to be supporting the community organizations that are trying to change neighborhoods for older adults. And this is something we care greatly about. Um, we've done a lot of work in joining coalitions like the Complete Streets Coalition, Transportation for America, because we want to make sure that the voices of older adults are at the table and that these solutions are not only for them, but they're for their families, because that's what they care about. They want, again, their children to be able to, uh, ha and grandchildren, to have the same experiences that they had growing up. So this is definitely where we're headed. We're excited to, to be in this space and, and are happy to be here. Great. Thank you. Shannon. So um, I just want to start with a little tiny anecdote, which is we are um, suburb suburbia refugees. We moved from Annapolis, um, where we had to drive everywhere, 
into Washington, D.C., and we live right on the red line, and our son is 16 years old, and he hasn't needed to get a driver's license. We've said, sure, we'll take you down anytime you're ready, and he hasn't bothered because he can get everywhere he needs. And as a mom, that's really a good thing because 16-year-olds are not very smart drivers. So, um, so what Richard Jackson is doing is incredibly important um, and, and so uh, gratifying to see you pulling together so many threads um, and, making, and making this effort really start to, to touch millions of people and, and reach millions of people. And it, it goes to the heart of something that I worry about a lot, which is how do we solve our health care spending problem? Um, and, and it's related to the fact that we can't seem to solve our health problem, and we keep seeing the rise in obesity and, and diabetes. And part of what you're really pointing to is that we have siloed. Um, we've, we've, we've put so many things, so many policy um, policies into different silos, so certainly at the federal level, probably at the state level as well. So when we subsidize commodities and don't subsidize fruits and vegetables, we don't think of the cost that we are then paying on the other end in terms of poor health. Um, when we subsidize roads and don't, and don't make sure that we have walkable environments, we don't think about the cost on the other end. And we don't have a grand strategy as part of, part of the reason that we're doing this. So. Um, from the healthcare perspective, I worry about how much we spend on healthcare, and um, and I worry about it because our long-term debt problem is really a healthcare spending problem. When you look at our federal spending on healthcare, it is it it just surpassed um, spending on defense last year. We spend more on healthcare at the federal level than we do on the military. So. Healthcare spending is has been going up faster than the rest of the economy for decades now, and uh, we, it, it's not sustainable. It's simply not sustainable. So, and if we want to see that spending continue to go up, leave everything the same and let obesity rates and diabetes rates continue to go up as well. So, redesigning the built environment is to me a twofer. And it's a twofer because if we can start to attack the, the root causes of things like our obesity ep epidemic, um, we start to be healthier citizens, which is really why we invest in healthcare in the first place. It's, I mean, right now it's enriching the healthcare industry rather than actually promoting health. But the other thing that a, new, a different built environment does is it offers an, us an opportunity to, um, to change the way primary care works. Right now, one of our problems is that people don't have very good access to primary care. It's not easy to get to your primary care office. And primary care itself is very disorganized and chaotic. And one of the things that I think this kind of um, rethinking the built environment does is it offers an opportunity to think about how, where do we cite primary care? Primary care should be very easy to get to. Our primary care office here in Washington, D.C., my family's primary care office is in walking distance of our house. It should be easy to get to. It should be open a lot. There should be caregivers other than a doctor there readily available to people so that we can keep people from having to go to the emergency room and having to be admitted to the hospital. And we know from demonstration projects that when you redesign your primary care and get a really robust primary care system in place, you have healthier patients, happier patients, happier providers, and you have reduced emergency d visits and reduced admissions to the hospital. So this is a, this is a golden opportunity for, for multiple things. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Um, Dick, just again, thank you so much for, for being here and for the great presentation and just really driving it home. I'm, I do sit in the, in the realm of the security world and having it kind of come at you so vis viscerally and with the stories of the obesity and the, and the diabetes and the heart disease, this really drives it home and just how important and critical and time. It, it, there's a lot of limits that we have on our time frame to be able to get this thing done, but um, this one just makes it all the more poignant. And I, I thank you for the for the for the presentation and also for the for the show we um i i i, I subjected my wife to a two-hour uh, dick jackson marathon last night and and uh um so um uh, it's just it i i recommend the 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 series to everybody um but what i think you're starting to, we're starting to hear on this is just how central 
the built environment is to the, the American dream. Um, and that w the way we've, that, that the conditions around which um, we redesigned the American dream the last time in the late 40s and early 50s, um, those fundamental conditions have changed. Um, and part of it is because we already built out suburbia. Um, that inner ring got built out and the logic of suburbia started to fail. But also because the external conditions, whether it's um, the need to absorb uh, excess uh, returning veteran labor, absorb excess industrial capacity, rebuild the rest of the world, um, cheap gas, whatever it is, all those external conditions have, have changed fundamentally. And, and demand itself has now changed fundamentally. It's, it's changed in two ways. One is that boomers and millennials have changed their housing preference. That's where this 56% of demand comes from, mostly from those two segments and then a good portion of my, my generation, Gen X, just don't want either the, the boomers are downsizing and they, wa and they don't want to get trapped without a car um, while they work longer into what they thought was going to be their retirement. Or millennials, their vision, as Chris is wont to say, their vision of the good life is not um, Leave it to Beaver or, or the Brady Bunch, it's friends. Um, they want to be with their social network that they've got connected through their iPhone. Um, demand has changed on that level, and demand has changed also um, globally. The demand for goods and services around the world is driving towards um, a requirement for radical resource productivity. We're bringing 3 billion people into the global middle class in 20 years. We've never done that before. We've already, got, we've already crashed the system with 2.5 billion people in the global middle class. Um, and we're going to add 3 billion more in, tw in 20 years. Their income and their resource consumption is going to go up 300%. They cannot live the American, the old American dream. Um, they cannot, cons they, they're not going to be able to consume our car, buy our cars, buy our refrigerators, buy our products, because they just, it's just not working. And we cannot continue to consume 25% of the world's resources that it takes to prop up this American lifestyle um, when we're only 4% of the population. So we're getting it from all sides. Um, we need a strategy going forward. Um, what, I'm, what I want to focus kind of the conversation around the panel on uh, now is, is, um, is, is to talk about this, the poignancy to talk about how, how do we get this message across to Americans. Um, I want Dick to kind of tell some stories about um, these 100-person uh, conversations he's been having. We're, we've all been talking around the country on this matter. Um, where, where the, where's the tipping point? Um, where are the opportunities? Um, because this, um, and, and I'm going I'm to be pretty bald about it, um, we've got two incredibly important, critical uh, legislative bills coming up in, that are already due right now. They're going to be pushed because of the presidential election. It's the transportation bill and the agriculture bill. Both of those bills lock us into this lifestyle that we're describing that is the problem. They're, they're five-year bills, authorization bills. If we get another five years and business as usual, even with some nice little tweaks, um, we're going to be in a world of hurt. We don't have that time frame. We're going to be treading towards this, the horrible di obesity um, uh, end states. We're going to be treading. We're going to be trending towards um, uh, increased shock and disruption coming to our shores um, because the system can't handle it. Um, we've got to move with alacrity. We've got to move fast. Um, and I just want to. What's what's catching on? Um, where do we, how do, how, do we, how do we sell this to American people? Um, and um, and, and where are, where's the low-hanging low fruit here? Did I'm going to tell three very quick stories, and I'm not sure I know exactly how to sell, I don't know how to sell this to the American people. Although, as my friend Howard Frumpkin and first author said, um, public health does a pretty good job. Um, we've convinced people to do things they don't want to do. For example, don't eat red meat 
get a colonoscopy and wear a condom. And we've been pretty successful with this, so, you know, we can <laughs> go forward as well. Um, the first quick story I want to tell is uh, I'm planning to offer a climate change and health class at UCLA this spring uh, with folks in the Urban Planning School. And I met with the students who were planning out these three hour a week for 10 week class. And the big message was, do not depress us. Do not tell us about what a mess we are in. You can do it for the first hour or the first day, but the next nine classes have to be about solutions and where we go forward. And we are so upset with the world that you have given us in terms of climate and all the rest. And we need to step up and need to go forward. And one of the things that came across very strongly and goes back to a little bit around the silos is in the 20th century, we dealt with problems by atomizing them, making them very small, solving them one at a time, looking at them very narrowly. And it doesn't work in the 21st century because everything is connected to everything else. And the only way you can move a spider web, web is to move the frame that's around it. And, and we really have to have a frame shift to make this go forward. Um, and, and the students, there's a lot of enthusiasm about transdisciplinary work. It sounds kind of boring, but they don't want to di dive deep any much longer. They want to look about it go going across the disciplines. We did a 15 minutes, about an eight minute segment in Elgin, Illinois. Beautiful Elgin watches that were made. In fact, a lot of the GIs during World War II wore Elgin watches made in Illinois. Uh, the company didn't move with alacrity when the quartz watches and the cheaper watches came in. Eventually it died, put 4,000 people out of work. The town center essentially collapsed. You know, there was nothing down there. They then adopted a sprawl model, became a bedroom suburb of, of Chicago, and over the last 10 years have embraced sustainability, have embraced community as its identity. And the students were organizing an event to creating a downtown sustainable place. And there's a very sweet episode where five or eight of the high school kids are meeting with the Chamber of Commerce saying, how come we can't walk anywhere? How come downtown is not fun to be in? And um, the Chamber of Commerce saying, well, we can't put stores there or businesses because there's no people there. <laughs> and, and it was really captured. But the town has done a wonderful job in putting the library at Town Square, getting rid of the Superfund sites along the Fox River, and really making it a place that people want to be. Is it a, a final success yet? No, but it's at least feeling like it's moving in the right direction, and that's really what all, we all want. The last very quick story is my, my niece Joanne happened to see the videos. Uh, she has three, she's a, a degree in, in both nutrition and environment, and uh, but now has three preschoolers, and she lives in a subdivision in Cary, North Carolina. And she said, Uncle Dick, my, my whole, I would love it. There's lots of young families. We can walk everywhere. But the exit to the subdivision, 100 yards over here is a shopping mall near a um, green route, a bicycle route and all the rest. But it narrows down. There's no sidewalk. And the cars speed up. And I cannot get there with a baby carriage or holding a toddler's hand. I have to get in the car to go 100 yards to go shopping. So she wants to organize a community event. So young people or people taking charge of their communities is, is really a very important first step, Patrick. Chris? You talked about the transportation bill. And uh, that is a critical bill that is right now being debated on Capitol Hill. Um, it'll probably be, from the Senate side, a two-year bill. So we get to revisit all this fun two, uh, two years from now. It should be a six-year bill. Um, it ran out and has been a series of continuing resolutions uh, for the last almost three years now. Um, and so it is a critical bill. Uh, unfortunately, the Senate in particular, even though it's a democratically controlled body at this point, is still a very rural body in their mind. Most people. On, uh, on both sides of the aisle still still refer to this as the highway bill, just as most departments of transportation in this country really should engage in truth and advertising and, and go back to their old label, which was the Department of Highways. Um, and so what we're trying our damnedest to do, and quite honestly not that successfully, is to shift the funding from 80 percent highways and 20 percent alternative transportation, 
alternative as in alternative lifestyles, counterculture, weird things that people do, which is basically every transportation category uh, that has been in the 10,000 years of building cities is alternative transportation. Only cars and trucks are considered real transportation. And uh, so we, we're, we're stuck with this 80-20. There's no movement on changing that. Um, nobody is going to propose raising the gas tax, which has not been raised in 20 years, and in real purchasing power has been cut in half. Um, so hopefully we'll get a bill out, though, that will allow for some improvements as far as transit-oriented development and mixed-use development to, to, to make that more legal in the bill. Right now it's generally illegal to do anything mixed-use. But so as not to spend too much time on the uh, depressing part, just as Dick was saying, um, I, I do want to reinforce that from a market point of view, from a real estate market point of view, all the pent-up demand is for walkable urban places. And the collapse of this economy in 2008 was driven by the overbuilding of the drivable suburban fringe. That's what caught, that's, that was the catalyst of the Great Recession. And at this point in time, uh, the price premiums for walkable urban places is anywhere from 40 to 200 percent when you compare it to comparable housing, compare it to comparable office space. So the market desperately wants this. And as a result, the, you know, with the collapse of the drivable suburban fringe, the land prices out on the fringe are now less than zero you would have to subsidize new sprawl to make that work financially. It just does not pencil, as we say in, as we say in a real estate. So to me, that's all very good news. There is a downside to it, of course, is that those price premiums are so high that it is a, a massive affordable housing problem. Um, but that's the market signal telling us, build more of this stuff so that we will eventually, hopefully, at some point in the future, uh, address that pent-up demand. But to me, it's going to take a good 30 years. There's, there's that much pent-up demand. Um, and so we need to have an affordable housing policy in this country that will address that market failure. Because we only add, by the way, 2% to the built environment in a good year. So if you know the 56% demand versus even in this market, D.C., which is quite advanced in this country, if we have 20 percent of our housing that is in a walkable urban configuration, I'd be surprised. Um, so 56 percent demand, 20 percent supply, 2 percent that you add per year, it's going to take 30 years to get there. So um, uh, we do have a challenge, but the good news is, is it's going to put a foundation under our economy putting to work people that have the highest unemployment right now, construction workers, um, and it'll put a foundation under our economy if we let the market uh, actually give the market what, what it wants. And right now, there's so many laws against it and the infrastructure is going the wrong direction uh, that it's a challenge. But I've, I'm enough of a capitalist to believe that the market will eventually get what it wants in spite of all of the impediments that are in the way of giving it what it wants. Amy, what do you think? Well, you know, it's, it's really interesting because I th we've gone from um, the talking about the community level and the individuals to the, to the federal level and the transportation bill. And, 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 and I think that your point, Dick, about it, it being, uh, the word that comes to mind is integration, that we've got to have a lot of folks from a lot of different walks of life working on this. And I think one of the great things is we've talked a lot about health here and economic development. And that seems to be the, those two uh, areas seem to be the huge drivers for a lot of the change. And we've actually seen that within one of the programs that, that we've been running at AARP over the last year. And you know, I, I actually believe, and seeing the power of this particular program, I'll tell you about it in just a moment, that what's really going to drive change are people like 
um, Dick's niece. And people that we meet across the country, ARP members, there's a Levada de Sales in Sacramento who is with Walk Sacramento and is trying to change the infrastructure of Sacramento. Um, you know, these people are, are starting to do simple things like pedestrian safety audits. They're actually getting out in their neighborhoods, walking them, evaluating them, and assessing them, and then showing others how bad it is at first, and then they talk about the good that can come from it. So I, I really think that the way we're going to see a lot of change is both by f fixing the, the transportation bills and such, but also that groundswell of these community activists that are starting to um, really understand the implications of this. So we've been working with uh, Dan Burden, who is with the Walkable and Livable Communities Institute, and he's been running active living workshops. We were in 14 states and 22 communities last year for ARP funded and, and uh, convened workshops, but we work with folks of all ages and um, a lot of folks from all different parts of, of the community, and we've had success in the health care area. Uh, we worked with Arkansas, Arkansas came at this from a health perspective. The Department of Health was our major partner there because they know on the diabetes chart that uh, Dick showed earlier, they know that they are the deepest, darkest red, you know, ground zero for, for health issues like diabetes. So they want to make their infrastructure more walkable. And we were in five communities across Arkansas. So, you know, th there are places like that that are starting to make change. Uh, from economic development perspective, uh, there are places like New Jersey. We uh, had a successful pedestrian safety audit in New Jersey and uh, a successful advocacy event and got the second Republican, Congressman Lobiondo, to sign on to the Complete Streets Bill in January. So, you know, there's, there are a lot of different ways to, to approach this. And, and I think that, you know, if we can continue to do, support this, this community level work, break out of the silos, it's really important, talk about healthcare and economic development in the same breath, um, then that's the way that, that change is going to happen. I'm interested in what the, my fellow panelists think about, um, I'm interested in what my, my fellow panelists think about um, smart growth initiatives. There's been a smart growth initiative in, in Maryland, the state of Maryland, and we watched it unfold in our neighborhood in Annapolis, which was outside of the city. It was part of the county. And there was a plan for um, changing the traffic route um, along this one sort of long single road that went down a peninsula and had all these little little individual suburbs peeling off from that long road. And, the, and there was this effort to sort of create a couple of nodes along the road that would be semi sort of community centers. And everybody hated it, rejected it. I mean, it, it's, it's sort of, this seems to be at odds with y your comment about demand for walkable, livable communities. You know, the interesting thing about the way that we've been building the country over the last um, 50, 60 years is this drivable suburban model that we've used, that we all understand, low density, segregated land uses, segregated by use, segregated by race, segregated by income, um, that, that that model, as you build more, the quality of life goes down. It's a more is less phenomenon. It, 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 that gets folded into how you finance these communities. It gets folded into the, um, how the community responds to these places. And as a result, the largest democratic movement of the last generation, which has been almost not studied at all in the, in the, um, in the academic literature, is the rise of neighborhood groups. And neighborhood groups arise to fight development because of the more is less principle. It's a perfectly rational way of responding. And now, with the walkable urban places, and Ellen knows this, Ellen McCarthy was head of planning um, uh, five years ago and got whipsawed on this very issue, that walkable urban development, as you build more, the quality of life of the immediate community goes up. And we know that not just from surveys, but we also know that from the price premiums that result in what I call the penumbra, 
the, the suburban places within walking distance of great urbanism, you're seeing price premiums of between 40 and 100 percent on a price per square foot basis. They basically have the best of two worlds. So, so the reality that we're, dis that we're just now discovering <clears throat> is that these places get better from a quality of life and therefore pricing point of view. But they have, th they, they're basically like generals fighting the last war. The last war is more is less. Today's reality in Friendship Heights is more is better. And that, that if you contain that growth, you put a boundary around it, I like to say build a corral, and you don't even think about going outside of that corral. And you manage for parking, you know, overflow parking that won't go into the neighborhoods. We can manage that. You, don't, you manage the cut through traffic. You manage the noise. Uh, and as Arlington has, has shown us, you can double and triple densities, and you can see the actual car counts go down. So there is no traffic problem. In fact, it gets better as you add more density. So th there's a great education that we need to do um, in responding to this new world. It's actually a back to the future world, of course. Um, and so you have the knee-jerk reaction of those real estate developers, they're bastards, don't, for some reason people don't trust us. I don't know why. Um, but with the, with the more is better phenomenon, you find that you start this upward spiral and you get two firsts and three firsts to, to quote you. Yeah, Dick, why don't you bring us home and then we'll open it up to q and I, I never talk about smart growth when, when audiences and I don't talk much about economics and real estate. I talk about what makes people healthy and what really is resonant is what makes people healthy. It's very hard to be happy when you are sitting in a car, white knuckled, either at high speed or stop and go. What makes people happy is to be in a community, be in a neighborhood, be in a central square, be in a place with family, be in a place where you feel safe with a cultural mix, and I'm talking music and art and food and all the other things, that makes your life feel full. And that's what we need to, I, I think that's the vision that all of us will embrace. One challenge came up earlier, and I just want to address it very quickly. Um, someone said that the physicians, uh, doctors, are not willing to step up on a lot of this. I will say to you that um, the physicians who are in, not doing fee-for-service, but are actually in practices like Kaiser, where they get a salary, they don't get more money if they do yep. more uh, surgeries or anything else, tend to be very much aware and, v and very, very strongly embrace this, and in fact, Kaiser Permanente's motto for the last couple of years has been thrive with visions of people walking and eating sensibly. So I think we're seeing the evolution in medicine too. Great. Okay, let's open it up to questions um, right here. If you could state your name and your affiliation. Thanks. Yes. I'm Michelle Sternfall. I currently work um, on healthcare related work at Archer Dimes, but um, I, in my last job, I was actually at HUD. Um, I have a PhD in sociology and public policy from Michigan, working with Don't Williams. Um, and I decided after doing my postdoc to go to HUD because I was very interested in actually getting some teeth on what sort of policies would impact health disparities. So I spent a year at HUD really working on how do you change non-health policies in order to impact health. Um, and my experience there, um, I'm sorry to be long-winded, but my experience there um, coupled with my experience now where I'm knee deep in the healthcare arena has shown me that at the federal level there's some major structural issues that um, are impediments to this work. So one example of it is in terms of economics that um, the costs and benefits, I think as you had said, um, are not internalized. So if you know that housing or building a sidewalk is something that's going to improve health and reduce costs in Medicaid, for example, the cost savings are not going to go to the housing people, they're going to go to the Medicaid people. So when you have different budgets, it's impossible in that case there to go and internalize costs. One opportunity that I've seen, and that potentially could be one way of breaking this, is with the Affordable Care Act, the new Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, where they're for the first time in their innovative Medicaid, innovative approach, are looking at things like population health, 
And how can you go and do things outside of the clinical setting and potentially get Medicaid reimbursement for it? I've heard virtually no, like no conversation about this. I encourage you to think about this as a creative opportunity. Um, the feedback I've gotten is that there isn't enough open evidence base. And there's a gun shyness from, from CMMI to look at non-health or non-clinical interventions. Where's the evidence base? Um, that's great. It. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We can get to it. Yeah. They can react yeah. to that or it's a great, it's a great point. Okay. But. Second, just second <laughs> question point, um, the prevention strategy and the prevention trust funds. If we're talking here about trying to go and actually impact our the health, one question I would have is um, the advocacy on things like the prevention trust fund which has gotten cut, or the Office of Sustainable Housing and Communities, which got defunded, um, the advocacy there is, is, is pretty, no. so actually, this is comments, I'm sorry. Any uh, comments to the comments? Could I? Yeah. Very quickly. Um, I'm very unhappy with what's happened with my old center at CDC, the childhood-led program, which I had evolved into a healthy housing program because it would make sense to look at all the aspects of an unhealthy home is being cut in the range of 30, it's basically being abolished, $30 million. The environmental tracking program, which was about $30 million, um, is also being cut dramatically. And that's important because the documentation you need that this intervention at this level makes a difference. There has to be corpus of knowledge there and information that one can build policy on. And so it's, it's slow to have its return, but until we have that, um, it, I, the good news is I'm seeing NIH, which is the deep pocket for most research, stepping up to these issues of built environment more than I have in the past. They were very slow to come to it. I mean, think about it. If we've seen a, a doubling in diabetes and the, from the fifth reason people need kidney transplants to the first reason now is is diabetes. Suddenly the Kidney Institute's more interested in what are the things we can do to reduce diabetes and this is one of them. Um, and the prevention trust funds being cut uh, or at least is, is threatened as well. Um, these are very hard times and, and people want you to show data and then they cut the programs that pr produce the data. Um, very very one, quick, just a oh, quick go ahead, comment. Go ahead. Um, one way we might start getting at this is the fact that, that most of the hospitals in this country are nonprofit and to maintain their nonprofit status, they're supposed to show a community benefit. And a lot of the community benefit that they claim is that they're taking care of people who are uninsured. Well, mm, that problem's kind of going to go away to a certain extent. But they also often say that they have things like free screening programs, which are of very dubious value and, in fact, often are kind of marketing programs for the hospital. I would like to see hospitals be pushed to actually provide community benefit that goes out and says, how can we improve the health of the community? Which is against their, their economic best interest because what they really want is sick people to keep coming in the hospital. But ultimately, I think we're going to have to ask them to do that. I think there's another, another piece of it is that where you can get to that broad internalized cost at a national level is looking at the U.S. budget. Um, and that's going to be one of our flagship projects here. We're working, uh, we're in negotiations with one of the f big four auditing companies that happens to be the main auditor of the U.S. government to look at um, an economic, uh, a robust economic model that internalizes these, um, this kind of the economic engine that we've been building out and then derives from that an alternative U.S. budget. So what you can see is across these various categories what the impact, using dynamic scoring, y what the impact of um, a systematic transition from where we are today to a much to a to a to a um, sustainable economic engine that's focused that 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 dials in in three main areas in the housing and transportation area, um, agriculture, and then uh, essentially a tax shift off of wages onto resource resources and waste. What that would do across um, the entire spectrum of the budget, that's where you can get. Um, internalized costs, but then you can demonstrate, okay, here are the jobs, uh, here's the deficit reduction, here's the health care cost reduction, um, here's where it's going to come in, and, and you, can, you can move across that is our, is our hope. Sir, in the white. Uh, uh, Randy Sim, uh, I very much appreciate uh, your, Dr. Jackson's uh, information, uh, but when you talk about the built environment, doesn't, isn't this a base or an argument for increased density? 
Yes. And if that's the case, isn't that really a truly contested subject? I mean, something that people either appreciate or don't. I even think of you know Congressman Tom Davis, a former congressman, a very astute person. I think he, I think the remark was attributed to him that density equals Democrat. <laughs> so I'd like to hear your responses. <laughs> and I live off the red line, so I can you know I ask that there is density is a very generates a lot of really vocal opposition. Yeah. You know, density is one man. Or somebody said it was one person's code or smart group is one person's code word for. Greedy developer or something. I, I will assert one that being in places where you can connect with people that have access to green space, that have access to transportation, that have access to healthy food, have access to cultural outlets, people are happy there. They do not want to live in cracker boxes where the noise goes through the walls. They don't want to live in a place where the ceilings are too low and the halls are dirty. Um, we don't want to live in places that have bad density. But we pay good money to go to places that have very good density. And I'll l defer to the real estate leader. Now, having, having spent uh, last month, I, I was in Paris and looking at a variety of different redevelopment projects that the French government uh, was uh, behind and, and then sort of running quick numbers and realizing that metropolitan Paris, which is twice the size of metropolitan DC, occupies one quarter of the land use of metropolitan DC. So it's, it's eight times the density of Washington. And the average sales price of a home selling in Paris um, is $1,200 per square foot. That's average. And went up last year 22% in spite of the EU's financial problems. So obviously, there's a lot of demand for density. and. Uh, in this country, th as, as, as I mentioned earlier, how that gets demonstrated is on the price premiums people are willing to pay for within walking distance of red line stations, which is uh, in this town um, just extraordinary. In January of 2000, the most expensive zip code in the region was Great Falls where my brother, who is a sprawled developer, happens to live. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that, um, that you would, for a two-acre piece of property, you know, room for a pony, um, and, a, and a McMansion, you would pay a 25% price premium on a price per square foot basis on, in January of 2000. And plus, you had one of the best school systems in the country. Uh, that's a 25% price premium over a DuPont Circle townhouse. By January of 2010, that DuPont Circle townhouse, which had one of the worst school systems in the country, was a massive 1,500 square foot lot, had a 70% price premium on a price per square foot basis over that same Great Falls house. The lines had crossed in the decade, and we're seeing that throughout the country. So the markets responded just within this last decade. If you had taken a look at that at that comparison back in the 1980s, when, when we don't have data for the 1980s at that level, um, that Great Falls home would, would probably be, you know, 100% higher than the DuPont Circle townhouse, which was then considered nearly a slum. Uh, so the market has responded to density that is, you know, that DuPont Circle townhouse is literally 80 times more dense than the Great Falls McMansion, 80 times. And the market has spoken. So we have accepted density. Now, in public policy debates, have we, expect, has, have we um, really you know, embraced density? Absolutely not. But that's fighting the last war, you know, fighting with the tactics of the, of the uh, last war. earlier, Shannon, about that Peninsula Road, too, is that, you know, people are starting to see, once people start to see these dense neighborhoods and what they offer, and that demand continues to increase, then, then behavior can change. I think the challenge is humans are very adaptable, and this gets into sort of behavioral science, but, you know, we're very adaptable, and so people have gotten used to a certain way, and they're afraid to change, and it's really hard, and so I think one of the, the big um, challenges for all 
all of us sitting up here and those of us who are trying to lead this movement is how to communicate the what's in it for me to people. Help people understand how much healthier this is, how much better it is to live in an economically um, vibrant place like Paris. Um, how, you know, how do we help people understand that this is, this is better for them and that they're going to get a lot out of it? And in some ways, we actually can't say that. We just need to change the structure so they, they start to feel it without even knowing. Um, so it, there's, there's a lot of uh, work that we have to do from, again, a number of different angles on this. Sorry. Uh, I just came from Brookings. Jeff Schmedeke, by the way. <coughs> I just came from Brookings, and, uh, and there are two things that I'm trying to tie together between both experiences this morning and this afternoon. Uh, over there, we're talking about the export initiative, et cetera, and the infrastructure bill came up, uh, the transportation bill. Uh, so there are certainly progressive thinkers over there who are going to just push the transportation bill the way it is because it undergirds you know, the, the thinking of getting export to market, getting out to the world, et cetera, which is a big priority of this administration as well. And then there's another competing uh, issue that we brought up here that <clears throat> while we're championing you know, density for healthy, well-educated people who can afford to live in DuPont Circle, it pushes poor people farther and farther out so I guess those two together, the question is, how are you going to figure out, craft a policy that will, you know, obviously people who are, who are empathetic to both, um, but how are you going to craft a policy that the policies are obviously good people? As I say, each of these walkable urban places needs an, a conscious affordable housing strategy. Our current affordable housing strategy in this country is, as you know, is drive until you qualify. So just keep on going another 20 miles out and you'll eventually find something that you can afford. That obviously doesn't work uh, in this resource constrained world and this climate changing world. So we need conscious strategies for affordable housing, but we also need better accessibility but the, the, the other thing which is a surprising change that we're seeing, and it's taking place here in D.C. first. As I mentioned earlier, Metro D.C. is the model by which we're building the built environment in this country. There's more examples here of where we're heading than any other, other place in the country. And that for the last 50, 60 years, most of economic growth went in what I referred to as the favored quarter the favored 90 degree arc coming out of downtown where most jobs went and much of the infrastructure went. In Denver, the favored quarter is to the south, in Phoenix is to the northeast, in Atlanta it's to the north, and here it is to the northwest. You know the favored quarter because it's where the white upper middle income housing concentration is, and you know it's, uh, it's, it's to the northwest because it's on the other side of town from the local minority housing concentration, primarily black, southeast, due east, Prince George's County. And then you know where we put the transportation uh, uh, networks, and you can figure out where the favorite quarter is. And virtually 80, 90 percent of all job growth went into the favorite quarter. In this town, as we've shifted so massively towards building walkable urban places, and by the way, right now, as far as the new announcements of developments over the last two years, 90% have been walkable urban developments. It's, uh, and, and all of the transit served. So we're shifting radically in that direction, thank goodness, because that's what the market wants. What we're also seeing, just beginning to see, is could be summarized by the fact that the green line is the new red line. The green line is the newest line, therefore it doesn't break that down like the red line does constantly. It has the most capacity. It goes to the northeast and to the southeast. And so we're beginning to see for the first time in at least 60 years, new market-based investment going into the non-favored quarter. And from a social equity point of view, this is the biggest thing in, in a century in this town. And hopefully it's a precursor of what's going to happen in this country as we move employment closer to where lower income households are. 
Let me follow up on the export-led growth kind of hypothesis. That's the what I think you guys were talking about in at Brookings. And my sense is that that export-led growth as a, as a strategy, manufacturing-led strategy, um, is backwards um, fundamentally. Um, what is going to bring manufacturing back to the United States is the a, a conscious decision to build a new American dream. That the market that we have to satisfy first is our own market. Um, if, if we're exporting into China, into India, into these growth markets, what are we going to be exporting? We're exporting um, products that are increasingly efficient um, in terms of energy, material use. Um, that's what's going to be going into these markets. Um, but we're not going to be able to sell it here. Um, while our own, while we then are forced to import consumer goods from it's it's not a lose it's not a winning strategy. Um, what this you know the, I think implicit behind what we're talking about is an opportunity to rebuild America and and to have a new American dream power create the opportunity for uh, a, that new manufacturing revival. Um, and and just as a as a just a the tip of the iceberg to kind of sh illustrate this. Just think about what we did. Um, uh, with a simple change in law around television. Almost everybody had to get a brand new LCD TV because we changed the law. We increased the standards, we improved the standards, and it forced everybody to go out and buy a TV. Um, the problem was they bought that TV from Korea, from Japan, from China. And so our, a simple change in law increased our uh, trade deficit. It improved the quality of the service and the reception, but we we gave it away. What we need to do is be able to structure an economic uh, strategy. And Michael Porter, the great Harvard Business School economist, in just this month in uh, Harvard Business Review, says we need America needs an economic strategy, not these single issue advocacy efforts on the behalf of certain special interests. We need a comprehensive strategy so that we can tap into this incredible pent-up demand three times in percentage terms, the demand after World War II eight times in, in total terms. So there's, there's an incredible opportunity. And, and you know what Chris and I wrote about um, two years ago in Washington Monthly, Salt Lake City, a chamber of commerce gets this. They know that to attract foreign direct investment into their area, they need to improve the quality of life so that they can attract knowledge workers. Um, and to improve quality of life, they had to essentially um, shift to a sustainable community plan, um, which also happened, to, by the way, to save them $5 billion in um, excess local uh, taxation and um, uh, meet all the, all the needs um, for, um, uh, for maintaining quality of the water, um, uh, maintaining uh, the quality of the of the natural habitat in the in the um, ecosystem around um, it's and it's attracting industry into the Salt Lake City hub. So my sense is that what we need to do that that there's no there's there should be no uh, trade off between um, designing for a sustainable prosperous and secure economy and um, and having that economy um, be able to engage this incredible uh, uh, demand function that's coming from the rural urban, urban migration happening outside our borders. So th there's, we should be able to capture both, uh, but we need to capture the demand here, put Americans back to work, put American capital back to work, and then move into exports. But that's my soapbox. Just a little bit of good news uh, out of this otherwise somewhat depressing panel is um, we all have to go and take a walk, walk around the block to get uh, to not be uh, depressed. Um, at the local level, and Amy mentioned this, um, there's tremendous demand at, that's been satisfied to increase local taxes to build rail transit in this country. There have been hundreds of ballot measures over the last seven years in this country at the local level primarily to, to raise sales tax, that's the form it, it tends to take, to put in place the rail transit and the biking trails and the walkability um, 
and, and, and so we, we have this anti-tax time, yet 70 percent of those ballot measures have passed. And so the Salt Lake City example, led by the chamber, uh, passed what is now under construction, the second largest light rail system being built right now in the country. And, um, but unfortunately, of course, we don't make any transit in this country. We don't have any manufacturers that build transit. And um, so it's another great opportunity that we have to take advantage of as opposed to importing that, that, that manufactured good. Yeah. One last question, and then, um, and then we'll wrap it up. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Miriam Gusset, I'm an architect and urban designer, and Professor Good to see you again. So I'm delighted with all the comments. I just want to remind you that really what you're talking about is old-fashioned neighborhoods. That we're, we're back we're to the class people, yep. you know, used to be able to walk to their jobs, they used to go yep. to school. I grew up in one of those neighborhoods back in the United States. It's really time to just get them back. I make all my students, and I realize this is really, it just shows how tough I am on my students. I make them watch Back to the Future. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, okay. Anyway, thank you. Well, I've learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Dick. Thank you. This has just been great with the entire panel. Uh, thank you for coming out on this wonderful, beautiful day. We appreciate it.